for those just uh, coming, this um, you are in the right place. I know this doesn't look like the University of Oregon at the moment, but uh, um, this is going to be a special presentation, Conversations with Quadra, with our very, very special guest, um, Amy Sanchez, um, lecturer uh, for Horn Performance at UCLA. I, I failed to mention my alma mater uh, on this title page here. Um, I'm very happy to see you, Charlie and Claire, Lauren, Nathan, Raymond, Rob, Milama. We'll bring you in uh, live as uh, fellow panelists a little bit later during this webinar, so you get a chance to um, kind of have a little more Q&A directly with Amy, so you're not having to go through the chat the whole time. Uh, but if you do have things you um, think of as we're having this conversation, please uh, feel free to throw it into the chat. Um, and either Lydia or I will um, catch that and then pass it on to Amy. And Lydia, how many more people do uh, we expect from your studio? Six or seven, but we can okay. we can get started, you know, whenever. Okay. I'm sure they'll all be popping in very soon. So when did you get your 501c3 distinction, Amy? It was pretty recent, right? Yeah, just very recently. Uh, I believe we got the official determination from the IRS, the official status um, in July. July. Um, wow. We had applied back in April and it took, took a few months for the IRS to get everything set, but we actually have been done some um, We've done some fundraising between now and then. Uh, when, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you guys are aware, uh, when you apply for as a 501c3, you can start fundraising, and then any donations will be tax deductible retroactively back to your incorporation date. So this is all all stuff that I learned along the way. Um, but we got our official determination letter uh, in July, and and so we're we're kind of ready to to jump on and start doing some fundraising and some more events. But um, you know, I've I've kind of got a lot of things that I juggle. And so at times I've been putting, putting, uh, putting some things on hold while I, you know, work on others, but, uh, but we're ready to, to really get, get working with a nonprofit. So. And you're, um, tell everyone the, the title of your nonprofit. Sure. Um, so yeah, the nonprofit itself is called Nkombi Wild. Um, so it's actually not a music nonprofit. Um, I never thought that I would be starting this, but I started a wildlife nonprofit. Um, so, you know, if you had asked me five years ago, I would have laughed about like, I know nothing about conservation and wildlife. Um, who am I? But, um, but yeah, I've learned a lot in the last, you know, four years or so since I got started getting involved in this. And um, I started off thinking, well, I can, I can help on the music side of things. Um, so I, that's kind of what I went to first is I can raise some money as a musician. I know a lot of other musicians. I can get people to play music. We can do some concerts. And so that's still definitely a goal, but very quickly real we realized that it would be best to have a, a partner organization with Nkombi Rhino, which is the group, the, the nonprofit based in South Africa, um, and to have a partner organization here in the US as a wildlife nonprofit so that all donations for Nkombi Rhino can basically come into the U.S. nonprofit and be tax deductible. Awesome. Um, yeah. So it's a it's an interesting thing. And then the music, Horns for Rhinos, which I'm sure we'll get into. I know yeah. we're starting in the Very middle. Very soon, but, yeah. But that'll um that all will be underneath the the nonprofit called Nkombi Wild. Yeah, it's it's an awesome journey. And you know, having spent, you know, a few hours this morning pouring over that journey, it's really exhilarating, exciting how you got there. Okay. So welcome to all those who have just recently joined us. Um, this is actually the University of Oregon studio time. I know it doesn't look like it, uh, but this is Conversations with Quadra. I'm absolutely thrilled to be um, here with my fellow colleague in Quadra, Lydia, and uh, maybe a few of our others will join us soon, Amy, Joe, and Adam. And we're very, very pleased to have as our special guest today, Amy Sanchez, who's a uh, lecturer of horn performance um, at my alma mater, UCLA, and is also a freelance musician down Los Angeles, and has taken just an incredible journey uh, since 2018. And we're going to kind of delve into that today. Hopefully, um, a good takeaway for many of you will be 
how this experience can maybe enrich your own experiences and how you might consider um, taking advantage of social uh, issue opportunities or uh, environmental issues that you care about and what you can do to kind of make a difference. Um, I would love to get started, Amy, actually kind of in the middle of your journey here, like in the midst of the pandemic, you decided, okay, schools ended in, you know, June, 2020 UCLA. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a five month road trip. And I'm going to go everywhere around the entire United States. And that's just unbelievable. That's incredible. And what I want to ask is like, it seems like you've always loved travel. You know, this, this road trip definitely seems to highlight that. And you're, you've written articles for the IHS, who's also um, spoken, um, how important that is. And I just realized before we go any further, I stop. I'm going to um, need to press record. <clears throat> oh. so I'm, I apologize. Let me get that going again. So I'm going to stop the share now. And let me get that going. Recording in progress. All right. There we go. So now you can't say anything. Now it's you, you, you don't want me to uh, repeat it again. So um, I want you, if you could, just tell us what does travel mean to you? What does it mean to get out there? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, travel has really just opened up a world of opportunities. Um, of course, it gives you immense perspective on life. It makes you maybe feel a little small, which I think is a good thing. Um, you know, kind of just goes to show how many people out, are out in the world doing different things and have a different outlook than you, a different perspective than you, a different culture. Um, so in that way, uh, I think it's good, I mean, good for our ego, makes us a little bit more humble um, and it makes us appreciate what we have. Um, and also see that there are other ways to live, other things to enjoy out in the world, um, other cultures to discover. So now, in that sense, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I mean, I, I say this also because you included a really interesting quote in the IHS article about your huge journey, this five months journey. You said, uh, if I quote, everything you want is on the other side of fear. And I think you were trying to connect because it sounded like when you did this trip, there were actually moments where you were like truly terrified um, because you're all on your own for five months during a pandemic traveling. Yeah. So I I would love to kind of understand a little bit more, like what does that mean to you and how does it reflect in your horn playing too? Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think that's a lot of it is that you have to push, you know, you have to, you have to put yourself in uncomfortable positions um, to kind of find opportunity and to find out, to dig down and find out who you really are. Um, that certainly translates to horn playing. I mean, so many times we get nervous. I still get nervous to play. Um, you know, in, in front of people, certain pieces, certain performances. And I think those nerves are actually a very productive feeling. Um, and what I found on not just the road trip, I mean, the road trip, sure, there were, there were definitely moments that I was apprehensive, a little nervous. Uh, you might say lonely. A lot of people said, weren't you lonely? And I thought, no, there's a big difference between lonely and solitude. And, and I, I was never lonely. I wasn't lonely, but I felt a great deal of solitude and found a lot of power in that, actually. Um, but so as far as, you know, sure, the fear aspect goes, I've experienced that many times in travel. Um, I've done a lot of solo travel in the past. Um, probably my first big solo trip um, was throughout Europe. Um, I took the train all over the place and up through Scandinavia uh, with a stopover in Iceland. A big uh, two-week solo trip. Uh, for my first one, um, but I've done a lot of traveling in Japan, in India, um, Israel, um, you know, kind of, kind of all over the place, and maybe not some of the most common countries. You know, I actually have not been to Italy. I've not been to Spain or France. Some of the more more common places to travel, and not that I don't want to go to those places. I certainly do, but I think I've always been a little bit attracted to the places that are maybe a little. A little more scary or a little bit less uh, approachable. And so, you know, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but I think I've just been drawn to that sense of adventure and finding, figuring things out for myself. Um, and yeah, as you know, what I have found, especially in horn playing um, and, and opportunity, is basically every single time I push myself a little bit further than is comfortable, something good comes of it. Um, 
And, you know, that, that might be, you know, if I'm, t I'm a freelancer in LA, so the gigs really run the gamut. I mean, there's a, a, such a wide range of work that I do. Um, and some of it's easy. Some of it is terrifyingly difficult. Um, on, on the spot, you know, re studio, studio recording at times can be very difficult, can also be easy. Um, you know, lots of, but every day is something new. Every week is usually something new. And so kind of rolling with the punches and being able to be flexible and adapt to an unknown situation is a place that I've learned to not only deal with, but I think thrive on. I really enjoy the variety. You know? Let's talk about one gig sure. that set you on like this, like epic path. So you get called, did you get called by Miguel at Wad Ferguson? I mean, yep. okay. So, and he had this project which involved going to this international jazz festival in South Africa, right? Okay. And so this is back in March, 2018. Um, and there's, by the way, a really fantastic IHS article about this. We'll throw this into the chat so you guys can take a look at this a little bit later. Um, but so you take this journey there. Um, and when you get there, you decide, I'm, I'm just going to do a safari because I've just always wanted to do that. Um, and a little off the beaten path. And you didn't even go to, it sounds like, what, one of the more common game preserves. You went to one that was fairly isolated. Uh, from what I can tell. Um, can you tell us about this experience? Sure, sure. Yeah, I had worked with, um, so the, the composer for this, um, the piece that I was going to play for the Jazz Festival, I'd, I had worked with him quite a bit in the past. We've done that performance. Uh, long story short, it's a jazz hip hop um, producer named Jay Dilla. If you're, if you're a fan of hip, hip hop, you probably know his music, old school hip hop. Um, and Miguel had arranged this um, whole suite of music of his um, for orchestra originally. And then as it got more and more attention, it got popular, um, he kind of made it, transitioned it and reorchestrated it for smaller ensembles. So when we were, uh, his, his group was invited to perform at the Cape Town Jazz Festival. Um, so it was a group of, I think there were, you know, like, two saxophones, a trombone, a French horn, an oboe, and him on violin and viola. Um, that was reduced from a full orchestra, but plus your whole oh. typical jazz um, rhythm section. So yeah, first thing first, I, I thought, oh, wow, an opportunity to travel to South Africa. I've always wanted to go there. Um, and as a horn player playing at a jazz festival, that's already like, how did, <laughs> that's already a neat opportunity. Um, so I was really excited about it. Um, we only had about a month notice on the gig, like it came up very quickly. So I just kind of rearranged everything and said, yep, I'm going to figure out how to make this work. But the trip was so short. We For traveling to South Africa, it takes a while. It's about a solid 24 hours of travel, no matter how you do it. Uh, usually a, either a, a, a flight cross country and then 15 more hours to directly to South Africa or 12 hours to Europe and 12 hours south down to South Africa. So it's a solid day of travel, um, plus layovers. And the trip, because we were literally just going to play a one hour concert at the jazz festival, that was it, <laughs> just one hour. Um, we went and did rehearse a little bit for the couple days beforehand, but it was only a, I think a four day trip. Um, oh. Yeah, so it was really short for all that travel. And I just thought, well, I've got to take advantage of this and book a safari. I've always wanted to do that. So I checked with a couple of other people in the band and said, hey, can anybody join me on a safari afterwards? I wasn't trying to go and do it on my own, but everybody was busy and had family and work obligations and said, now nah, I got to get back. So, so yeah, I just started looking into it. And the way that these things happen, you know, this is one of those, those moments where I was, you know, to use the, the quote a little bit, pushing through fear a little bit, because I started looking into these safari opportunities and didn't know the first thing about it. Um, and I was looking, I mean, you know, you start Googling safari opportunities in South Africa and very quickly you realize just how many options there are out there. And then you start reading all the message boards on TripAdvisor and people are warning you about scams and, you know, crazy things. And so eventually I ended up um, going basically through a travel agent um, that was willing to work with my very limited budget and um, I was trying to do it as cheaply as I could. Um, and 
And so I went went with that, that travel agent and they recommended a private reserve outside of the Kruger National Park area. So Kruger National Park in South Africa is where most of the wildlife is. I mean, there's wildlife all over, but that's the main um, safari destination. But it's a national park and um, there are paved roads and there's a lot of cars. And so it can get a little bit busy in the national parks. It's still an incredible experience, but it's, you know, it's a... It's just a, uh, not as an exclusive of, a, of an opportunity. And I thought that's what I would be going to do, but she said, oh, I can get you a private, um, a reserve, or a, a safari on a private reserve with a smaller group of people. There'll be maybe six to eight people in the safari vehicle. And in a private reserve, you can go off-roading. You don't need to stay on roads. You can track animals out into the, into the bush and um, there'll only be a maximum of two cars around. So this travel agent really helped me understand that it, there's actually a lot of variations in the safari industry. Um, and so that's, that's what I decided to do. And I said, well, is it unusual for me to, you know, for somebody to go on their own? And she said, well, you know, a lot of people of course come with, with family or partners, but she said, actually safari is one of the best things to go do on your own because you're immediately put with a whole group of other people. Um, when you go on the vehicle, you're on game drives, going to look at animals and wildlife together, and you're having meals together. And so she just immediately said, no, it's actually a great solo trip. Um, so that's, that's how it happened. That's how it started. And, and by chance, just to maybe get where, you know, to continue on real quick, by chance, um, my safari guide happened to be the, one of the founders of Nkombi Rhino. And so of all of the reserves, of all of the, there are lots of safari camps, there are lots of lodges, um, tons of places that I could have gone in South Africa. And it was just by chance that my safari guide happened to be involved in conservation work directly. And he and his brother run Nkombi Rhino, which is the nonprofit that I now work with in South Africa. So it was just a relationship because, you know, we hit it off and got along and stayed in touch and I showed some interest. And um, there we go. <laughs> I showed so some can, interest. Yeah. You can see him trying to play the horn right now. Um, he Excellent technique, I want. Wow. It's perfect. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think both hands were on the horn here and, you know, but that was the funny thing is, you know, I was there on safari and everybody's like, why, why do you have a French horn with you? And I, I kept it in my lodge room. You know, I wasn't, you know, I was like, well, I just came from playing the Cape Town Jazz Festival. And so everybody thought that was really interesting. And the horn became quite a topic of conversation amongst the other safari goers and they all wanted to try it. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was definitely, I think something they had not seen before. Something that really struck me as I was you know, preparing to speak with you today was finding out that one of the ways to actually deal with this crisis that's um, happening in Africa, that you know, three rhinos are being killed every day, and that if, if something's not done, they're all going to be just extinct by 2025. That just blows my mind to think such an iconic animal could be extinct at that point. Um, but that one of the ways to try to reduce that was to dehorn them. And I also was kind of flabbergasted to find out that actually the horn grows back, yeah. that it, it's kind of like our, our, our fingernail and all that. Um, and for those who want to take some time a little bit later, I highly recommend the video that's in this article. Um, it was an excellent uh, first <clears throat> introduction to all this. Um, so here you are just out there in the safari game, trying to get to you know the animals, the environment, all this. And then you're, you've, you come to learn about this work. Like how, how did that, can you think back to 2018, how that affected you then? Yeah, it was, it was really quite interesting. Um, you know, I'm on safari and getting the full, the full like traditional safari experience, seeing all the animals got to see the, the big five, um, you know, the, the major animals that people expect to see when they go on a safari, as far as lions and elephants, and you know the rhinos all of that stuff um and i saw beautiful rhinos with full horns and you know just really majestic and i knew a little bit i had heard a little bit about what was going on with the poaching crisis um of the rhino horns but i didn't know a whole lot and so i just you know casually were sitting there watching these rhinos from the vehicle and they're just massive and Honestly, I mean, it might sound a little silly, but they look prehistoric. They look like a dinosaur, right? I mean, from from for the layman, it's like, well, these are prehistoric animals, and um, you know, they've been around so long. 
And so just to understand that, okay, this is one of those things that you hear about that somewhere, somewhere on the other side of the world, there's this animal and people think that it has some sort of magical medicinal qualities to it, but they've done the research and it doesn't. Their, their horn is literally made of keratin, which is the same as our fingernails, um, the same as our fingernails and our hair. It's compressed hair and keratin. So there's no medicinal quality. It's not magic. Um, and it's, you know, people also take rhino horn to be a status symbol of wealth. Um, you know, it's just ridiculous, honestly. Um, you know, I always tell people like, can't we just grind up fingernails and fake it? Um, <laughs> those, those ideas have been thought of before. Um, but anyway, so, you know, just basically it was just being in awe of these animals on safari and then asking my guide, uh, you know, gosh, have you ever, you know, have you, have you heard about the poaching and does it happen often? Have you ever seen a poached rhino? And he's, yeah, actually I'll have to tell you more about that later, but I'm, I'm actually pretty directly involved. Um, my brother and I started a wildlife nonprofit to, to work with these animals. Um, so that's how it started. It was really just kind of an innocent question of, of seeing that. And, um, and one of the things, I mean, that was when I was there, they had been doing dehorning of rhinos on certain reserves, but not in the area where I was. And that was one of the interesting topics, topics of discussion is that a lot of reserves for a while really held out on having their rhino horns trimmed because they want tourists to see the majestic rhino horn. That's what people want to see. You go on safari, you want to see a beautiful rhino as you've seen it in, you know, pictures and, you know, you've, you've seen it all your life. Um, but part of, you know, out of necessity, they've started to dehorn all of these rhinos so that they don't get killed for their horn. And we talk more about that more if you'd like but um so out of necessity they started doing that on more and more reserves and what they have found is that actually when tourists see a rhino without its horn now it, it actually makes such a bigger impact right you see this majestic majestic animal now and it it begs the conversation like wait a minute even if you had never heard about this issue before wait a minute what happened to that rhino's horn and then a conversation has to begin and people immediately leave as more of an ambassador for wildlife and for their protection because their personal safari, their their quintessential traditional safari experience has been influenced by the fact that there's a really grim reality out there of what's happening. Well, and it sounds to me like that's precisely what you did after the safari. You said, I know, we need more ambassadors. And you came back within six months um, to the same place, but this time you you brought with you what any other artist would do, three other musicians. Um, <laughs> like, why go just as a single horn player when we can bring a whole quartet? Yes. Um, and it some of the experiences there sounded really, really, really cool. Um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about some of the musical experiences um, that you guys enjoyed on that trip. And also, um, I'd also like to maybe get a little bit more of a deep dive into Tim Parker and what he's been doing with the anti-poaching units and what that does that mean um, in that area as well? Sure, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, so when I went back, um, you know, I came back from the first trip, my mind was blow just blown, couldn't stop thinking about it. And um, as I mentioned, my safari guide was the one that I had been in touch with and I kind of was bugging him saying, hey, can I do something here? And he said, well, actually, crazy twist of events. Um, my brother, who founded the nonprofit, um, you know, the, the two of them together, um, he's actually the one who does, is involved in most of it. His name is Joe Peterson. And um, he said, it sounds kind of crazy, but I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mention this, but Joe is actually a professional rugby player as well. Oh, okay. Well, everybody in South Africa plays rugby, right? Okay, sure. And he's like, yeah, but he's actually, he's you know, a little bit of a celebrity. He's a well-known rugby player, and he's actually was just hired to be the captain of the major league rugby team in San Diego. <laughs> I thought, well, that's odd. I didn't even know we had major league rugby in the U.S. Um, but <laughs> shows how much I knew. It had just started the year prior. But um, so he said, yeah, he's in San Diego right now with his family and you guys should meet up and chat. So um, so that's how it all got started. I wor started working with Joe and the, the nonprofit um, more fully there. We planned the second trip. Um, I raised a little bit of money on my own in between and then I planned the second trip and just happened to bring three horn players. Um, and so when Joe found out and Joe's not a musician by profession, of course, but he's a great guitar player um, and loves music. And so when he found out that I was bringing 
four, that four horn players were coming on safari with them um, to learn about rhino dehorning and anti-poaching efforts, um, he just said, well, you guys have to bring your horns. Now, I mean, I don't know about you guys. I love the horn, but I don't want to travel with my horn all the time, right? Especially not for a, all the way to South Africa for a, just a week trip. Um, I've gotten kind of used to taking a little bit of time off of the horn um, when I can, when I can afford to um, on trips. So I just, you know, I, and I asked my friends and I, you know, they were all like, ooh, no, we don't want to bring our horns. We don't want to play. We want to go on a wildlife adventure. Um, but he talked us into bringing uh, one horn. So, so what we did basically is we brought one instrument and we, uh, surprisingly enough, when we were out on game drives, we would bring the horn with us in the case. And then we'd take a little, like uh, they call it a sundowner or a, uh, either a coffee break in the morning or a sundowner where you have a cocktail and watch the sunset in the evening. Um, so we'd, we'd take these little breaks out on game drives. So you've got the safari vehicle and the four guests and, um, and our guides and Joe and the tracker and we'd pull out this French horn and set up neat little scenes with the with the with the coffee or with the with our cocktail in the sunset and um, we would play out in the bush. So we recorded a lot of like kind of b-roll footage. So we weren't we weren't actually playing most of the time. We were just kind of faking it or you know playing something quietly. We honestly didn't want to disturb the animals <laughs> that were out in the wilderness. We figured we're going to scare off any animals within a five mile radius if we start playing, you know, the long call here. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, so we, we took all this, you know, video footage of, of us playing and with the idea that we were going to take a piece of music that was, is of course very near and dear to South Africans, which is their national anthem. Um, and their national anthem, I mean, our national anthem in, in, in the U.S. obviously is incredible and it's beautiful, but they definitely in South Africa, there is a, a, a very, there's much, there's a big passion that goes along with their national anthem for a whole lot of historical reasons. Um, so as soon as I played a kind of a, a, a mock-up version of this horn quartet for Joe, he had tears in his eyes and said, we need to, we need to record this and play this for everyone. And it'll, it'll touch the hearts of so many South Africans. You have no idea. And so, um, so that's what we did. We multi-tracked the, um, the four horn parts and it's, it didn't come out perfect. We didn't stress about it too much. We didn't fuss because we were on safari in South Africa, right? So it's not the most perfect recording ever. You know, when I'm sitting here chatting with a bunch of horn players, you know, my little musician brain goes, goes there, but I'm telling you, we would play even just the melody, one person, um, you know, for you mentioned Tim Parker, he was the um, he was the person running the anti poaching unit um, that Nkombi was working with at the time. They've since well, partnered with several different groups, so they work with other organizations now as well, um, including a group called Ranger Fit. Um, but they take uh, locals from locals from the communities in South Africa, um, uh, and and they basically teach them, you know, not only to be a ranger and how to work and work with wildlife and work out in the bush, but how to be basically part of an army. And it's a little sad to think of it that way, but it's, it's basically a war, war on poaching. Um, and they use very army-like, uh, military-like tactical methods to try and combat these poachers, um, because it's, it's quite an intense situation. Um, so they work on training these anti-poaching units. And um, so we got to visit with them and, you know, you see, so you've got this, this tough, you know, um, Chuck Norris type of type of character, if I can call him that, um, you know, with, that is used to carrying around rifles and training guys to be really tough in the face of what is what a, a very, very dangerous situation. Um, doing all this military training and I pull out the French horn and play a little bit of Nkosi Sikulele Africa, which is their national anthem. And he, same thing, almost in tears immediately from the first few notes. And he just said, you know, the fact that what we're doing here has inspired you guys to come here and not only witness it, but to make music out of it and to, to bring this story to other musicians, like it just meant the world to him and, you know, everybody else that we talked to. So, yeah, it was a- Do we want to hear it? Oh, sure, if you've got it. <laughs> yeah, I, I happen to have it right here. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to cue this up. Um, bear with me, everybody. Um, I haven't 
tested this in a Zoom webinar situation. So if this is not working, uh, do let me know right away and I'll, I'll find another way to make this work. Um, but I think this will work. Yeah, that brings back memory. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and I'll just share one little anecdote about that. Um, in the video, you do see rhinos a few times in it, um, but in particular, there's one spot where Alicia was playing. She was the one that had the Nkombe rhino on her shirt. Um, and she was sitting around the water, and that was the last, um, our last night on safari. Um, and you know, as I had said, we a lot of the time when we were filming, we were kind of just pretending to play and just messing around. That's why the valves don't really line up with what you hear all the time. Good enough. Um, and uh, but you know, when we were there that last night, we just thought, oh, let's play. This will be fun. We'll play some some fun stuff, some excerpts. It was a it was a, a you know the sun was setting and it was our last night. And so Alicia started playing. Um, I know for a fact she played some Strauss, she played some Brahms, she played Strauss one. Um, I can't remember which Brahms symphony she played now, but she played a bunch of excerpts. And um, and as she was playing, and again, we're kind of all laughing, having some gin and tonics and thinking, oh, we're scaring off the rest of the animals. No, we're not gonna see any other animals the rest of the night now. Um, and as she played, Joe kind of just like, tapped us all and he's like, oh my gosh, guys, look. Across the water, those three rhinos came out and you see them very briefly in that video. You can go back on, it's on it's on YouTube and you can find the video. But three rhinos came to the water on the other side of the, the little pond where we were, the watering hole, and just calmly came down. It was a mother and um, it was, it, it was two, two um, a mother and a calf and another cow, another female rhino um, that came down to the water and drank casually and hung out for a couple minutes and then left and we i mean alicia was in tears we were all just you know astounded um you know i guess that just proves that rhinos like uh horn music as well <laughs> so Brahms and Strauss doesn't scare them away. Um, in case you're just joining us, this uh, is indeed the Oregon Horn Studio, but uh, in a different guise today. This is Conversations with Quadra, and we're talking with Amy Sanchez, um, professor of horn at UCLA and a freelance musician down in Los Angeles, and some of the experiences that she's had um, since 2018, which are many. Um, so check out the article that we've already put into the chat. Um, Lydia, might, you might be able to put that into the chat one more time in case people have recently joined and don't see that. 
Um, and this f trip not only was a wonderful experience for you to meet all these people and to share, you know, artistically with the con conservation efforts and really see how the two merge. And that seemed to get even stronger over time. Um, but this was also a chance for um, two of those horn players to get engaged, right? Yes. <laughs> At that ex exact same time when the rhinos came out. Two of the horn players, it was Emily Rapun and P Victor Pesavento, um, got engaged while we were there at the watering hole. Um, they were so secretive, I, we actually didn't know until later, but they got engaged on that trip. So yeah, so that was a, a pretty big moment for them too. <laughs> um, and this, we just had someone join us uh, behind Amy. It's Amy. Um, <laughs> Oh, and we also have Greg. So Greg and Amy are here. Uh, Greg Rusa and Amy Jo Ryan, uh, both members of the uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic. And um, I'm actually absolutely thrilled. Um, Amy Jo is able to make it as um, one of my fellow colleagues in Quadra. So you got three of Quadra here now. Uh, so we got triage and perhaps um, uh, uh, Ad will be able to join us a little bit later. Um, Lydia, can, go ahead. Can you just say where, where you're at and how these people yeah, just happen to wander into the room? Oh, sure. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not, <laughs> they didn't actually just let themselves into my home. Uh, this is not my home. Um, so I'm I, I'm lucky enough to play with the LA Phil this week. They've been kind enough to have me around every once in a while. And so obviously they're here at work. Um, I will be at work as well in about an hour. So we have uh, they had a rehearsal this morning and just finished um, and then kindly came in to join on their lunch break and we have rehearsal again starting in 55 minutes. Um, and actually this week uh, was kind of interesting. I'm, I'm curious how, how it went, uh, but uh, Andrew Bain, the principal horn player of the LA Phil is premiering a concerto um, written by Chris Bowers. Um, and so I know they just finished rehearsing that. If you listen very carefully uh, while we were chatting before, you might've heard a little bit of no music in the background and that was Andrew rehearsing his uh, concerto oh premiere. Goodness, yeah, yeah. Not, so, an e not an easy piece. Not an easy piece. And, and, we, and <laughs> we just got the music a couple days ago, so. <laughs> yeah, I mentioned that to Daniel before we started. I said, yeah, yeah they just got the music of, a few days ago and, and um, you know, Andrew didn't have it much sooner, so <laughs> it'll be an exciting adventure. But yes, it will. Yeah. yeah, very similar to what we're talking about right now. So you're you've now been to South Africa two times: once in March, once in September. You've come back. Okay, now most people, most I, I dare say the word normal people, would leave it at that. You know, <laughs> that would be it. Like they they collaborated with them. They got to know the person who's now living in the States. This is lovely, but not you. No, you decided to take this to a whole nother level. Um, and you started having more conversations with Joe Peterson. He's the rugby player playing um, down in San Diego with San Diego Legion, right? Um, and, and the founder of Nakombe Rhino, or one of the two founders with his brother um, in South Africa. So you're having more conversations with him and then you start to think of okay what what kind of artistic um uh, events could i plan here um down the southland that would help support the efforts um back, back in south africa so can you kind of talk us through what what you did after you came back and how those those plans came to fruition sure yeah um exactly i mean you know bringing three horn players uh, and, you know, kind of unintentionally recording this, this little music video in the bush um, was really inspiring. And, and we just thought it was fun. You know, we just, we, I didn't really, even when we did that, I didn't really see, I didn't, I wasn't really thinking, okay, where can I go with this? But I was just kept, kept getting deeper and deeper, more involved. Um, and of course the friends that I brought, um, so Victor Pesavento, the, the guy that you saw in the video, um, he's a horn player, but he doesn't really play professionally anymore. He's actually a fantastic orchestrator um, and composer. And so he works for all of the big composers in LA doing a lot of orchestration and copy work, um, including orchestrating for John Williams and really like some <laughs> of the most incredible composers that we all know and love. And um, so, you know, we got talking um, and I just kind of threw out there, you know, that horn quartet was really cool, Horns for Rhinos, and the, the name is just kind of awesome, if I do say so myself, you know, that was, that was everybody kind of does a little double take and they're like, oh, I get it. <laughs> um, and, and so I thought, but you know, I don't, 
you know, I, okay, I love horns. I love horn quartets, but I wanted to do something that was, you know, maybe going to make more of a splash and make, you know, make a bigger impact, um, just be more visible. And so I thought, okay, well, horns, brass ensemble can still, we can still call that all horns. Let's just expand this and make horns for rhinos a kind of uh, flexible instrumentation um, that could be a brass quintet, it could be a horn quartet, it could be a full horn ensemble, or it could be a full brass ensemble. Um, I mean, I guess we could make a trombone ensemble. We can do, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of what we started thinking of. And the more that, um, so Joe Peterson was playing rugby in the, in the States every year for about five to six months. He's in San Diego, usually from uh, December or January through May or June. And, um, and so he's been doing that the last few years. So every time he was around, we'd get together and with his family, he's got a beautiful wife and, and son. And so we would, we'd all get together and, um, you know, just end up kind of watching a lot of nature, cons uh, nature documentaries, wildlife conservation talks, things like that. And, um, that just became the goal is like, well, let me see what else I can do. Like I'm, I don't have a lot of great connections as far as like just going out and finding you a big donor. Like that's not really my strong suit, but I know a lot of musicians and I know a lot of people that have heard about, you know, my trips to South Africa have been really interested in learning more about this issue because it's just something that we don't really hear much about in the States. Um, and so I started talking to musicians and just said, you know, would you be willing to donate your time? If we had some really fun music arranged, would you be willing to donate your time so that um, we can do a benefit concert? And, you know, not surprisingly, um, everybody was, you know, really on board with it. Um, and I was blown away by some of the musicians that we got to join in. Um, and so, so yeah, Victor Pesavento, the hornist slash orchestrator arranger decided to help me. Um, and he arranged a lot of music. Another, um, orchestrator arranger composer, Nolan Markey also arranged some music for us. Um, and even wrote a fanfare for us. We basically commission, commissioned a short fan fanfare from him. Um, and so it's the way it started out was really just through the rugby connection. And we just went the easiest route possible. He said, um, originally he asked us if we could play the national anthem at the rugby game at one of their matches. So that was the original plan. And then for some reason that, that fell through, but they asked us to play at halftime. Um, I almost just called it intermission, but no, <laughs> at halftime <laughs> of the rugby match. And, um, so, so at halftime, uh, we just sat up in the courtyard and people were walking around to food trucks and, and we had a booth set up. Um, with lots of information about the conservation efforts, of course, of, of Nkombi Rhino. Um, we took donations. We had a little merchandise that we sold. We had these great Horns for Rhinos t-shirts. Um, actually, we weren't selling those, although I, I think I did sell, them, sell some online. Um, but we sold some other merchandise. We actually had our own coffee made. We were selling coffee. Uh, you know, kind of just lots of little things. Um, and we played a bunch of music at halftime to kind of just drum up interest. Um, you know, we had a big banner that said horns for rhinos and I would just kind of talk to people that were interested. And Joe was out there as the captain of the team and his rugby gear talking with people at halftime too. And it was, it's pretty amazing because the, um, the announcers during the game were actually would, talk quite often talk about Joe as, you know, our conservationist from South Africa, you know, who's the star rugby player. And so they would often mention his nonprofit during the games and also brought up horns for rhinos several times. Um, so that's how it started is we took the easiest route and got involved with the rugby thing because he had already, already had a network of people that were really interested. And we have a short clip uh, oh, sure. that the little promo clip here to show everybody. Uh, we can kind of give you a, a flavor for what it's like. Um, again, this is this is taken from a San Diego Legion game, yep. right? The slightly smaller ensemble than the one that we followed with after this. And I can show a clip of that a little bit later, actually. Um, so give me a second. Keep, keep your fingers crossed, everybody, that I do this correctly. <laughs> you're, you're nailing it. It's, this is great. Make it easy for me. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> yeah.
pretty sweet. Yeah, so that was the first iteration of it. And we played a whole lot more than that. We played, um, basically our goal was to kind of play Africa-inspired music. So um, with both at that concert and then with a an even fuller brass ensemble for the next one, the next thing we did was a... Um, a concert in Oceanside, um, and that was partnering with, uh, it was Nkombi Rhino, partnered with another uh, conservation organization that is based in San Diego, and it was kind of helping Nkombi Rhino, you know, work through the financial side of things at the time, since we didn't have our own 501c3 started yet, right? So they were acting as basically a fiscal sponsor in the US. So we did this um, joint partnership um, fundraiser for Global Conservation Force, or GCF, and in Combe Rhino and Oceanside. And that was a really neat event because um, what we did was it was basically a full concert, but we would play, you know, two, three tunes, two or three tunes, and then um, a group of uh, four different conservation pan um, panelists would speak about a certain issue in conservation. So they all kind of had their own. Um, their own organizations that they ran in conservation, wildlife conservation. And so they would address questions from the audience or topics that they had discussed beforehand. And we showed several videos, um, some videos from our, our trips and some of the work that they've done, but also just some educational videos on all of the, the wildlife um, issues, not just rhino poaching. I mean, there's plenty of other issues as well. And Nkombi Rhino does work with lions and elephants and um, cheetahs, wild dogs, a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, this is so this is the group Horns for Rhinos um, the, as the largest brass ensemble that we've done. You know, five horns <laughs> and um, and all sorts of good friends. I would have called Amy Joe for this, but, I, you know, she's busy with the L.A. Phil, so <laughs> um, couldn't steal her away. But um, but I did. Uh, so Emily Pesavento is in there, the one who got engaged and married to Vic Pesavento, and um, he's in the center of the picture. Nolan Markey is, um, was the guy conducting in the last piece, and that was the composer who wrote that fanfare. And then, the, I mean, so many incredible players there. We've got um, two djembe players. Um, the trumpet section is incredible with Dave Washburn on principal, and he's um, a major studio, studio player, um, soloist that you've heard as a principal trumpet on hundreds of films. Um, and just just really fantastic players all throughout the ensemble that all donated their time. Um, and so we played, yeah, music like inspired by Africa. So we played uh, stuff from The Lion King, um, played something from Amistad by John Williams. That was one of my favorites. Um, oh gosh, now of course I can't think of everything, but of course- Jurassic we... Park, of course. Oh, yes, Jurassic Park. Now that's where we get, we're, that's why we use the term inspired, loosely inspired, because of course Jurassic Park has nothing to do with Africa, but it just feels like it, right? Prehistoric, you know, our rhinos are dinosaurs. Um, so yeah, we played Jurassic Park, and then of course we couldn't leave out the classic um, Africa by Toto. So that kind of, uh, you know, was towards the end of the concert that was right before our encore. And I cannot tell you how much fun it was to have a whole crowd just singing along and clapping, you know, to Africa's Toto. I mean, when they started singing, you know, you know, bless the rains down in Africa. And like everybody's clapping along with this brass ensemble at a conservation event in California. It just, it really kind of, you know, hit home. And, and again, the, that event was so special to me, not only just to get to play the music, but to see how many other people this really touched. And, and all of those musicians came up afterwards and said, you know what, we need to record this. We need to make an album. We need to sell it. I'll play for free. We need to take it, take all the proceeds from this and turn it into a big fundraiser. So that's next on the list. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay, good. We'll grow for in this time. Um, and yeah, so, you know, it was really fun, you know, obviously for the people in the audience, you know, people in the audience came, I had friends that came, but a lot of people were there for the conservation aspect of it, rightly so. But so many people um, just said how much the music really elevated the experience, you know, and, um, and Joe himself, you know, he was filming a little bit while we were rehearsing um, just of us playing Jurassic Park. And he, he just said, oh my gosh, I can't believe he's like this, you know, we put a big picture of a rhino on the background in the back when we played Jurassic Park. And again, you know, he just said this, it's just everything just feels so much more elevated with music there. And yeah, 
that's what we do, right? That's we all know that. But to 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 kind of put that out to a general audience of people that are more into conservation, um, it was really a neat combination. And uh, I felt like we just kind of brought a whole new group of ambassadors together. So it's really neat. If you're just joining us, um, this is uh, a Conversations with Quadra with Amy Sanchez. Um, she's a lecturer in horn performance at UCLA and has been um, leading an effort, quite frankly, ever since uh, her first um, visit to South Africa in March 2018 to raise awareness and funds um, for um, an organization to help try to stem the efforts there um, of poaching against rhinos and many other things. It it sounds like the organization there, um, and just a quick glance at the website, anyone can see that, uh, Nakombe Rhino does much more than just rhinos at this point. Um, they've really branched out to a lot of other things. Yeah, quite a bit. Um, they'll do a lot of... Um... They've, they've worked with, with African wild dogs, which it may not be an, a species that a lot of people are aware of. Um, if you've ever saw Planet Earth with David Attenborough, he taught, he did quite a great segment on wild dogs there. That's often how people know about them. Um, but they're incredible animals. They're actually the number one predator in Africa, wow. which is the, the, the most successful predator. Lions are, you know, sure they're scary, um, but they're not very successful. They have to work really hard. Um, their 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 success rate at their at in their hunts is not as, as strong as the wild dogs. Um, so for various reasons, um, they work with wild dogs. Um, that population, it's a very endangered population as well. Um, and they'll also do really interesting work with lions and cheetahs um, in particular, where they do relocations. And um, what I thought found was fascinating is. Um, they actually do that for basically for genetic diversity. Um, yeah, that's sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. <laughs> they do that for um, for the purpose of genetic diversity um, across a population, and that's basically because. You know, we think of Africa over here, we, we kind of think of, of Africa as just this big, vast space, right? Where all the animals roam and it's just this massive, massive space. But the reality is, is that most land in Africa is managed. Um, and it's when I say it's managed, it's for good reasons, um, because people have to live somewhere and animals have to live somewhere as well. And so they manage the land so that animals have their space um, and, you know, people also have their own safe space as much as possible. Um, but unfortunately, what that means is there are a lot of fences, right? There are a lot of fences and land being sectioned off and cordoned off. And Kruger National Park in South Africa is huge. It's the size of a small country. It's I think they say it's the size of Wales, if that helps. Um, but um, so it's the size of a small country. And then that's just the national park. And then you've got all those private reserves around it. So the private reserves are actually, they don't share, um, they don't have a fence with Kruger National Park. So the animals can roam from this huge country of Kruger National Park into the private reserves. But then of course there's a fence on the border of Kruger National Park and all the private, private reserves to keep the wildlife out of, you know, off of the highways and out of the residential areas. So throughout Africa, much of the land is managed like that. Um, there are some areas in Botswana that are truly wild where there are no fences and animals can go wherever they like. Um, that's where I actually visited this past summer. Um, so it's a little different experience. Um, but again, part of the problem with managed land is that these animals that should be roaming for hundreds of miles or thousands of miles in their, in their habitat tend to only and basically they get inbred they 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 you know they they instead of their their population spreading and you know they, sure they might have one region where they they mostly live um their territory still individuals come and go and they mate with different areas and and so that's what keeps the genetic diversity of the population and keeps the populations thriving and healthy and one they started realizing with all this managed land populations were weakening because they were losing the diversity, um, the genetic diversity. So that's why now they do relocations of animals and bring, just physically fly in a helicopter, like two lions in a helicopter and fly them over to another reserve, um, or even a whole pride of lions bit by bit, or cheetahs, same things. Um, they'll do that to spread genetic diversity. So there's a lot of efforts that happen um, for the health of the population. And then they also do a lot of emergency wildlife care. Um, 
there's you know there are snares that are set for hunting and animals get caught in that and then suddenly they need to go in and try to you know they don't interfere with a lot of natural wildlife things but when it's a man-made cause and it's hurting an animal that is endangered and protected they try to jump in and save that animal that wildlife so what i find fascinating with all your work and what you've just described that the combe rhino is doing um, it speaks a little bit to what we talked about at the very beginning, you know, that experience that you, you spent those five months traveling throughout the United States. And I think also this, this sense of really understanding the interconnectedness w between everything, especially within nature. Um, and just the idea that in nature, we, we need these wild animals to go huge distances in order to maintain genetic diversity. We need to get the top predator healthy. I mean, that seems odd, right? But that that is necessary in order for nature and the environment um, to be healthy. Um, so you do these efforts initially artistically, but now you decide post-pandemic, no, I'm going to not, this isn't just going to be about art. I'm going to start a wildlife conservation um, nonprofit. Can you talk about where we are um, today? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I've been involved in more and more trips and I've um, I've been actually the other side of things is uh, is because of all these trips that I've gone on and I would share a little bit on social media about um, I had a lot of friends, mostly musicians, contact me and say, well, I want to go. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and so I've started arranging trips also. I'm not truly a travel agent, but um, but obviously I work with Nkombe. They have their own safari camp there, so they're able to do um, conservation safaris um, at a, a fairly affordable rate. I mean, a trip to Africa is never cheap, I will admit that, but um, at a fairly affordable rate for a traditional safari, um, they're able to do pretty much everything in-house. So they have their own camp. Um, Willem is the guide, of course, because he's a licensed, trained guide. Um, Willem was the safari guide brother <laughs> that founded the nonprofit. Um, and so he, um, so they have their, their guide in-house. They partner with all the conservation groups um, in order to do a project. So people will come on safari um, and part of the cost of their safari goes to fund a conservation project that basically they're, they're donating to the conservation project, but they get to be there hands-on um, in person and work with the animals or see exactly where that money goes. Um, so it's a really neat, it's a really neat collaboration that we've been able to arrange. And now I've, I've run a couple trips like that where we bring guests over. So, so that's a, been a big part of, of my involvement lately and maybe part of the reason that I haven't had the time to push ahead with the music side of it as much. But, um, so, so that's the tourism side of it, but to be able to accept tourism, um, accept donations and transfer that over to the nonprofit, right? We needed a 501c3. So as I mentioned earlier, we, um, Nkombi Rhino South Africa used to partner with Global Conservation Force in San Diego, and that's still a, an active partnership, but um, they were their fiscal sponsor so that they could accept donations here in the US and, and send them over. Um, but very quickly we realized, well, you know, I'm working so regularly with Joe and Nkombi Rhino in South Africa. He said, well, would you be willing as an American citizen, would you be willing to start a 501c3? Um, and, um, and, you know, I said, well, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we did that. Basically we worked on that over the pandemic. Um, and in April we filed, um, filed all our incorporations, all the business side, the legal side of that nonprofit. Um, so it's called Nkombi Wild. And um, so we're sharing the name to kind of keep the branding the same. Basically, it's it's basically the same organization, except we're the U.S. branch of it. Um, legally, it has to be a separate entity. Um, but so Nkombi Wild is the wildlife conservation nonprofit that I started. And through that, Horns for Rhinos will be a project underneath Nkombi Wild. So now we, we have a nonprofit organization that's not technically a music organization. Oh, thanks. Not technically a music organization, um, but uh, but that project will run underneath it as well as any other projects that we end up working on, um, which we've got a lot of ideas um, and we're just just basically launching it all now. Um, but yeah, so so Nkombi Wild started um, and this is, you know, kind of uh, it's not an official Nkombi Wild Instagram, but this has a lot of my my travels. I've also done a lot of work in Alaska. Um, 
Sidebar, I'm also working to become a pilot. And yes, that is inspired by my African travels very much. Um, so, so, um, can you uh, yeah. talk a little bit more about that? <laughs> I mean, that's about a, what? The about pilot stuff? The pi yeah. I mean, how do you, <laughs> I think you told me you were inspired to get your pilot's license so you could do some bush. Yeah, uh, flying bush flight in, in South Africa. Yeah, you know, it, that would be a long term goal. Um, you know, none, none of this is, that's not going to be an immediate thing. I mean, I'm not quitting my horn career anytime soon. I love teaching at UCLA. I obviously love the freelance work that I get to do. Um, I love the variety of that, but you have to start somewhere if you want to be a pilot. And so I, I've been getting my, um, working on getting my private pilot's license. I've actually been uh, pretty much done with uh, all of the training for the private li license since mid-July. Um, but then I went to Africa and I went to Alaska, I did some travel and then school started. And so I actually um, have my, I hate to say this in case it doesn't happen for some reason, but I have my, um, my final check ride exam this coming Saturday to, to be an officially licensed pilot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's been another adventure. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of delays because of weather and timing. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll happen Saturday. Um, but yeah, well so... So long term, the goal might be to be able to fly in Africa or Alaska, um, do some bush flights, whether or not it's for tourism or for conservation. So there are more, you know, licenses, there's commercial licenses, more ratings that I would have to get as a pilot. But years down the road, I think it would be possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I, um, I, at this point, I would love to like invite all the rest of our attendees to be participants and let's just uh, open this up to kind of a, a group conversation um, so that everyone can feel comfortable kind of sharing what they do. You don't have to go through the chat to do this. So let's take a moment. Um, we can kind of treat this as like a, a mini one or two minute break while I slowly bring every one of you in. Um, and um, again, Please put your hands together for Amy. That's just awesome hearing all about this. So, um, and while you're bringing everyone in, um, I just want to say that I put um, Amy's Instagram uh, in the chat. So if if you want to follow Amy on Instagram, there you go. Thanks, and thank you both to Lydia and to Daniel as well. I mean, first of all, Lydia actually helped me when um, I was writing the IHS ar articles. Um, she was uh, she was partnering with me on that and was a, a really big. A big help on all of those articles and a you know big reason why there were several uh both online and in in the ihs horn call um and then amy joe of course you know got me uh on here today and so it was really nice to to be part of quadra and then also just to know how this ties into your theme mm -hmm. for the, for the year and um you know working with nature and finding music everywhere in nature and in the world and i just i love that concept um, and then also Daniel, of course. I mean, my goodness, you're such a great host. You've made this easy. You should you should do this professionally. I, I'm trying to channel my inner Terry Gross. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's interesting. You should say what you just mentioned. Um, uh, Quadra, we do ha um, also tie our artistic projects to um, social causes. Um, last year, we started our work with the unhoused community, which we'll be continuing this year. And uh, we have a huge program coming up in March called Nature Calling for Harmony, which is going to be a ton of fun uh, putting together. We commissioned a wonderful uh, player that I think many of you know, um, uh, Jeff Scott. Uh, he teaches horn at Oberlin. He's written this fantastic piece for four horns and um, uh, piano and four vocalists. So super looking forward to that now one of the things i'm going to have to do in order for you to everyone to see each other i don't know why this is the case but i have to make you a co-host so give me a second why i not only do i have to promote you to panelists but i also have to make you co-host um so i think i've promoted everyone everyone should have received it um while you're doing that i just one thing that just really strikes me is so important amy about what you said is that, um, you know, oftentimes as musicians, we don't know, like, what can we do, you know, to make the world a better place, you know? And the fact that, like, just bringing music to an event that's to raise money for an environmental cause, like, you know, people who aren't musicians don't don't understand how impactful that can be until it happens. And then they're like, oh, wow, suddenly, like, our audience is so excited to be here, and they just donated, like, twice as much money to our environmental cause. Like, like we can really be impactful, and um, what we have to do is collaborate 
you know, we have to find causes and people, you know, and wherever our shared values are and, and make that happen. Um, so we're not, we're not powerless as musicians. And I think it's really cool that all the things you've done, obviously, I think it's super cool. Oh, thanks. I encourage those who are now co-hosts, which almost all of you are um, within the panelists, to please uh, turn on your video. Uh, we'd love to see your faces. And I, I'll just thank you, Lauren. Real briefly, hello everybody. Nice to nice to see y'all. Um, I'll just mention briefly. Um, actually, she's here right now, Melanie. I'm putting you on the spot, but um, Melanie is actually uh, Melanie Yohe here in the in the corner for me. Um, is a grant writer that we've been working with. Um, and so I think her, her company is Grant Strategies, LLC, I believe. I hope I'm getting the name right. Um, and uh, so so we've been slowly working a little bit on, um, on applying for some grants and that'll be more and more as we get established here. Um, you know, as I said, uh, I feel like I've kind of been wearing a lot of hats in my life <laughs> um, as a horn player, as a teacher, um, as a conserva conservationist, travel person somehow pilot i don't know so I've, I've been juggling a lot of things but um i'm bringing somebody like melanie on board and other people to help has been really good and um you know we obviously have a board for the nonprofit as well so i'm just kind of getting fi figuring out how to start sharing the responsibility more and then i think we'll be able to make even more things happen um and as lydia mentioned the impact that we have or that we can have is it's surprising to even to me too. Um, you know, I started doing this just because I thought it was neat, um, and I couldn't believe how many people want to get involved. Um, and so that feeling of, you know, Joe Peterson, um, uh, who would probably join this chat right now if it weren't in the middle of the night in South Africa, um, uh, he 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 always says something that I I love. He just talks about you know if you're if you're one person in the dark with a candle. Uh, and you find somebody else with a candle in the dark, you share a whole lot more light, right? You shed a whole lot more light. And he says it a little bit more eloquently than that. I think it's a quote. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, if you um, basically when you when you find a cause that you're interested in and whether or not it's a cause or it's just something that you're passionate about, right? It doesn't have to be this great social justice cause or an environmental issue or, you know, it doesn't have to be an actual cause, just if you find something that you're passionate about, just move toward it, right? Just just go follow it. It doesn't have to be a career. It doesn't have to make you money. It just has to bring you a little bit of joy, right? So when you find that passion, whatever it's for, just move toward it. You don't have to have a plan. You don't have to have a goal. You don't have to know what you're doing. <laughs> you don't have to know anything about it. Just follow it. And then you're going to find other people with that same passion and they're, that light's going to spread and you're going to keep attracting more people and keep attracting more opportunities. And I think that's what's happened for me is that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I had no clue about conservation work. Um, but I just kept talking to more people and being open about it and finding more and more people that wanted to jump in. And next thing you know, I'm starting a wildlife nonprofit. Um, so opportunities come when you push past that fear and push past that unknown. And I just think that that's completely possible no matter how you do it if you know as a musician as an artist as a writer it doesn't matter right but you find those people to share your passion with and you'll collect others along the way and then doors open <laughs> yeah what one thing that i caught on one of the videos this morning that joe said is just the ripple effect which is just, you know, drop that one little rock in that pond and it just creates all these ripples. And you've created so many ripples in so many people's lives um, through this. It's commendable. Um, at this point, I would love to have other people just, you know, just raise your hand if you've got a question and we'll just um, go ahead and it could be to anyone here. Um, you could, it could be a question. I'll get your, the, the synapses um, firing on all five gears. Um, or is it six gears in cars these days? Um, and to give you just a few ideas, you know, like you could ask questions about like Amy's career. How did she get to where she is today and her position in Los Angeles? Um, you could ask um, questions uh, specifically like, you know, you know, Amy as a professor at uh, UCLA, what's it, it could be more horn specific, like the audition process, what's it like there, um, getting into that school and the like. Uh, it could be questions more about um, uh, other conservation um, 
and other travels that she's taken, um, eff conservation efforts or travels that she has done in the, in the past few years. So does anyone have any questions they want to uh, throw out there? Yes, Lauren, go ahead. Uh, hi, Amy. I'm Lauren. Nice to meet you. Um, I had a question while you were talking about, you know, you just talk about like funding a lot. And obviously now you have like a whole entity to deal with all that. But I was wondering about funding, like for specifically, you said when you first went back to South Africa with that group of like three other horn players, you said you like raised a bit of money. What did funding look like before the whole nonprofit thing? And do you have you learned any things that you like wish you really knew before? That's a good question. And I'm still really learning. <laughs> I'll say that much. Um, I feel like I'm really just at the beginning of, of learning how to fundraise a little bit. Um, I'm definitely not a pro at it, which is why I brought people like Melanie in and um, uh, the treasurer for a nonprofit also um, uh, works with other nonprofits and is in the on the financial side of the industry. Um, so he has a little bit more fam familiarity with that as well, because yeah, it was all new to me. Um, before the first, the first um, fundraising that I did, it's as easy, anybody can do this. It's the easiest thing in the world. I did a birthday, a Facebook birthday fundraiser, right? Which I'm sure you've all seen many of those, you know, so-and-so is raising causes for this organization. Mm -hmm. Um, that was all it was. That was it. Um, I paired that with, uh, I wrote basically a newsletter and I sent it out to just about everybody I know. I probably sent it to like, I don't know, 700 contacts in my email. So I'm sure there were a lot of people in there that were like, what are you talking about, right? Who are you? Um, but so I sent it out just kind of, you know, I tried to explain things, uh, as you can probably tell, I tend to run on a little bit. I, I probably wrote a lengthy email explaining why I went to South Africa and how I was involved. Um, but I was specifically just, I had a goal of trying to raise money, enough money to do um, well, as many rhino dehornings as we could. At the time it was costing about $1,000 per rhino. Um, they've been able to lower that cost a little bit by doing um, as many rhinos as possible now. Um, but so I raised, yeah, I, I think I raised about $3,400. So we were able to kind of save um, at least temporarily uh, three and a half rhinos maybe. Um, and yes, the horn does grow back, so they have to do that procedure again, basically in every two years they trim the horn, just like you would trim your nails. Um, but so that was that was my first fundraising effort. It was as simple as, I don't know how else to do this, I'll do one of those birthday fundraisers, right? Um, my birthday was coming up and I thought, okay, I'll do that. And then I sent out an email and kind of did a little social media push along with that. Um, and I was surprised. I was like, well, that wasn't too bad for a first attempt. Um, since then, um, I've been partnering more with a nonprofit in South Africa. And so their, their kind of name power and all the partners that they work with certainly helps. Um, Joe's celebrity status as a rugby player, um, he kind of uses that quite a bit to, um, to you know, find find avenues um, and work with, um, he gets corporate sponsors, sponsorships and stuff like that. Um, but to be perfectly honest, I mean, you know, I love the, that you said, now that we have a nonprofit, we have this whole entity to help, right? It's kind of still just me, right? This is the whole entity. I like, I wish it were like, you know, I've got a whole foundation of people that are, that are on my side now and are going to help me fundraise and teach me how to do it correctly. But it's all the resources that you seek out. So again, that's why I, I found um, Melanie. Um, Melanie is actually, a, a, she's a grant writer that works with, uh, believe it or not, I found her through another music uh, organization that I've been involved with in Puerto Rico, the International Chamber Orchestra of Puerto Rico. I've been playing with them for about five years and she was doing grant writing for them and being wildly successful with National Endowment for the Arts grants and all sorts of other funding. Um, so I just kind of contacted her and said, hey, I know you do music grants, but would you be interested in working with wildlife? And you know, she, unbeknownst to me, had a huge uh, passion for wildlife as well. Um, so it's all in finding people to help you, really. Um, I mean, I've learned a lot um, and I have a whole lot more to learn, but it's really going to be about finding the right people to, to help you out with it. Because unfortunately, just because you start the organization doesn't mean you magically have any other resources on hand. Um, there is a ton of information out there though it just takes a lot of time to sift through everything online and do the research and, and find it so i hope that answers your question <laughs> yeah totally thanks so much yeah the foundation center is not a bad place to start quadra's been a nonprofit for 21 years so we have a little bit more of that 
experience, if you will, but it's um, it it raising funds in any uh, for any kind of organization is a little bit different depending on who you are. But to speak to one thing that Amy just said, it's all about conversations. The more you have conversations with people about your idea, the more you get them excited about your idea, excited about what's going on, the more they're liable to support you in any way. And I love the fact, Amy, that at the end of your IHS articles, you would say, if you have an idea of where we could play, or if you could write a piece for us, or if you want to join in on it, or if you want to donate, you know, you that's important too. People are able to give in many different ways and giving them lots of different avenues to help you and, and to be a part of what you're doing is really important. Um, we just have a few more minutes here. Um, are there any other questions people want to pose to our, our star guest here, Amy? Lauren's going to pose another question if no one else jumps if in. no one so. else has one, I have another one. Okay, go for it, Lauren. Follow up. Okay, I just want to ask in general um, about the path you took getting into like yeah, like recording freelancing. I'm sure other people are really curious about that too. So yeah, um, just curious about that. I know you went to USC, which probably, you know, helped you get into that, but yeah, otherwise what happened? And I want to make sure that we get Lauren's question, but we also get to Claire's question yeah, and that absolutely. probably will be a time at that point. Um, so go ahead, Amy. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, the, you know, honestly, the the answer to that is in, in any freelance career is this a little bit the same as the last one it's all about people um unfortunately in the freelance world and that's what studio playing is there there is no audition um every basically what i always say is that every gig is an audition for your next one right and that's not to, to put it uh, make it a super stressful thing feeling like oh my gosh i've got to play every single note perfectly i think amy joe's heard me mess yeah, up well, enough times oh, that <laughs> No, but it's true. You're only as good as your last performance or yeah. your last rehearsal, your last gig. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and so, you know, it's not that you have to be perfect, but you have to make a good impression. And, you know, unfortunately, as, as far as a short answer goes, that's the that's the best thing that you can do is use your network and it starts in school. So yeah, for me, I went to USC um, when I, I'm, I teach at UCLA and my students have an incredible network. And so it starts by somebody just above you on the ladder, if we want to call it that, somebody that's just above you, maybe just a student that's a year or two older or something like that, that had an opportunity that they um, can't do, right? They got, they maybe got a better opportunity. And so they ask you to cover their church gig, right? That was my first gig in LA was a church service for somebody um, or playing as a ringer for a high school orchestra or a community orchestra, whatever. That's those are always my, my first gigs. Um, and it was just covering for somebody that was a friend that knew me and trusted me, right? Had a good impression of me, even though maybe I had never played a gig with them. Um, and they took a chance to give me an opportunity. And that's just how it works. And I mean, I know that sounds like, well, how does it build from there? But it really does, especially in a, in a larger city. Um, if you're in a city with an, enough stuff going on, then people get busy and work kind of trickles down basically. So those opportunities, you know, the more the people in the LA Phil and the studio are busy, um, they need people to play in the regional orchestras or to do the other recording work that's maybe not for the top movie, but it's still other recording work, right? So all of that music, all of that work gets passed down and down and down. And so when 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 things get busy, it's good for everybody. Um, and that's basically how you just start climbing the ladder. But the best thing I would say is talk to people, be professional, be approachable, you know, be friendly and, and show up and do a good job. You know, obviously you have to be able to play well, but that's kind of the bare minimum, right? You have to really make a good impression and every single opportunity is your audition for the next opportunity. Awesome. And Claire, go ahead. Hi, I have another freelance question, and it's probably too big for these last few moments, but in broad terms, what are your favorite and least favorite parts about freelancing? That's a good question. Um, my favorite, honestly, is the variety. I absolutely love the variety of what I get to do. Um, I, I feel really lucky um, to get to do things like play with the LA Phil. I mean, that's, you know, that's a, a dream come true. I've gotten to play with San Francisco Symphony. Um, you know, a lot of really fantastic groups and, and, um, and 
So I love the variety. I love the fact that I get to play with different people all the time. Um, and, and nothing against, I mean, the LA Phil section is great, but you know, they have to play with each other all the time. You know, <laughs> she has to play with her husband every day. Um, <laughs> so, so um, but you know, I love the fact that I do get to play with different people all the time. That's a really special thing for me. And it kind of feels like my community and my family is, is, is larger. Um, so I love the variety of that. And, um, and the variety of the kind of work that I get to do. So I'll get to play orchestral stuff or studio stuff or chamber music or jazz or I, I recorded on um, Kendrick Lamar's album. Like, so I've got to play with Dave Matthews band. So, I mean, who, you know, it's, it's really neat to get to do all that variety of stuff. Um, and the other thing I love about it is that it affords me time to have a little bit of flexibility and to be able to travel and take advantage of other opportunity that comes up. Um, what I don't like about it is that it's stressful um, and I feel like I spend a lot of my time scheduling. But that's really the only downside. I, I love pretty much everything about freelancing. Um, it's just that it's stressful and it's time consuming and it's kind of hard to plan in advance. I always you know, feel like I, it's hard to commit to things because I'm very worried that uh, you know, an opportunity will come up that would be really hard to turn down. So, um, you know, you don't want to be that flaky freelancer. Uh, it's, but there's, there's a reason that happens sometimes because sometimes for the good of your career, you really need to take one opportunity over another. And there's all sorts of um, professional ways to try to do that as best you can to try to not burn bridges and to try to maintain, you know, the relationships that you have. But, um, but in general, I, I actually love freelancing. It's just that you have to know it's a long road to get there. And um, it's it's not for everybody. You know, I can if, if you like routine, it's not for you. <laughs> um, but if you have the persistence um, and, and patience and can, you know, sometimes I'll even say in, in a town like L.A., um, it's it's a lot of persistence. If you can make ends meet and not be super uh, frustrated by it. If you can find some joy in anything that you're doing, you know, you have to be able to find the positive in any gig that you go to play. You can't be, you can't get knocked down too much by the difficult ones um, or the, the situations that aren't great. So if you can be persistent and find teaching or find other things that you, that can help you um, make ends meet. Um, you know, I worked I worked jobs that were non-music jobs, and I can tell you about that some other time. Um, but I worked jobs that, that weren't even involved in music. Um, I worked at an architect's office when I was in grad school in LA. Um, so, you know, just to make ends meet so that I could keep taking the crappy gigs that would get me to the next level gig, right? Um, so you have to be persistent. You have to be willing to, um, to make ends meet until the dream gigs start coming, right? Um, and it's still up and down, you know? I mean, I still have weeks that are harder than others, weeks that are more boring than others, um, weeks where there's no work. Um, but after a while, it gets steady enough and um, you end up having some really neat opportunities. So in general, I love it. And I just love the flexibility that it has afforded me to be able to work on things like this. <laughs> Speaking of routine, I know many of you have classes to get to, so we'll make sure that you can get to them. But if you could please um, give us those smiles and a big wave to Amy, that would be awesome. Good job. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And then thank you to Amy and Joe for having me here and um, Daniel for hosting Lydia as well. And to Adam Unsworth, um, who I'm sure is, is busy, but, um, but I love the, the, the playing that you all do. I hope, we, I hope you'll come and play with us. Sometime. Oh my gosh. I would love to. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Or, or we'll come to UCLA. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll do a, I think we'll do a Horns for Rhinos thing. A Horns okay. for yeah, there we go. There we go. Project. Great. I love so that. thank you all so much for, uh, being here and being a part of all this and i hope you have a fantastic weekend um, and wonderful thanksgiving take care thank you thanks so much bye, bye. Thanks. Thanks.